Hello and welcome. I'm Kay, and today I have the immense privilege and honor to introduce you to a very, very special man. I was actually introduced to him by one of my previous interviewees, Darren Main, which if you haven't checked out his videos, please do. He's stellar. But my guest today is Christian de la Huerta. Uh, I read a copy of his first book, Coming Out Spiritually, and I was personally gobsmacked because I'm like, oh, holy shit, I have been stealing his words without realizing it. Um, I read this book and said, this, this, we are, we are kindred spirits. Um, this is something I would have written in a different form, but he did it better and did it first, and I love that. Uh, he has a new book out, which I'm sure we'll be talking about today, but Christian, welcome. I'm so honored. Hey Kay, I'm so happy to be here with you. Um, you know, there's just so many areas of, of overlap and shared experiences that we've had that we uh, discovered together, even in just one conversation. But um, I do share that that sense of spiritual brother, and um, yeah, so happy to be here with you. Oh, and glad friend. to know you're out there doing doing the work as well. Oh, likewise, my friend. Likewise. So we, I've been speaking a little obliquely around some of the crossover, but one of the things that Christian talks about in this book, and I highly recommend it, is this idea that we as queer people have always been the harbingers of change. We have been the connections to spirit. We have been purveyors of heart. That there's these archetypical roles that we've fulfilled that in more modern times as patriarchy and you know, fear of the feminine has arisen, um, has been shoved aside, but that that's part of our natural gifts, part of our natural abilities. And I know for Christian, one of the things he shared is that a lot of his work has shifted in recent years to really focusing on the upliftment of women and working to combat misogyny and prejudice against womanhood. And so I would love to just hear more, for you to share more about your journey of where you've been, where you are, where you're going. Um, and then the last thing I'll say, which I would love to talk a little bit too, is uh, I've often said, and me and my husband have often had conversations about how the world doesn't have so much an issue with homophobia so much as they have a fear of women and uh, a disaccreditation of women in their role in society. And if we solve the world's femininity problem, then the queer problem would large, in a way, take care of itself. So if you feel called to speak on that as well, I would love to continue our conversation. Yeah, and by the way, I forgot to say that um, Darren Main is stellar, and I, I quote him, I can't remember if it's in the book that you're holding or this current one, um, but yeah, he's another, another brother. Um, and yeah, that's the, the way that you just framed it at the end of your, of your words there. Um, that kind of mirrors my my journey in terms of the work when I, I've been doing the you know personal transformation work for for 30 years um, and it started out with you know my community the the gay community the queer community um, and that's what kind of inspired this book because I, I founded an organization called Q spirit that Q spirit that was uh, its mission was to help us reclaim our spiritual heritage uh, because it's it's tragic that so many in our community uh, want nothing to do with spirituality because we confuse it with religion and no wonder given the way that that we have been treated and continue to be treated by many religions is like I don't know many like I did threw the baby out with a baptismal water I wanted nothing to do with anything that that had to do with spirituality um, or religion um, so the work has, or my own realization, like you were talking about, it, was that misogyny and homophobia are two sides of the same coin. And that I really believe, I landed in that conclusion that, that I think you did too, that misogyny is really the deeper one. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we can you know, talk about, about that, you know, what, for, for example, I know like um, some of the same biblical prohibitions that were, you know, like the, the, the five holy texts of terror that are used to condemn homosexuality, uh, such as, you know, you, should, you shouldn't lie with a man as you, as you do with a woman. It doesn't, and it doesn't say anything about women lying together with women. Why is that? Um, because, you know, women weren't even property, weren't even human then, they were property, so, so who cares? 
um, what, what women did. But even today, um, in even like harshly macho homophobic men, you talk about two women together, it's like, ooh, I, I want to get into that. Or But two men together is like, yikes, shoot them or kill them or the yuck factor. Um, and so what is that? And, and, and what I've come to think is that two women together is not a threat to the status quo, to the existing power structures, whereas in their mind, two men together is one of them is willingly uh, forfeiting the superior male status, and that is a threat to the status quo. Um, yeah, so, so that's why my work, I mean, I still, of course, work with everybody, but uh, in this last book, Awakening the Soul of Power, I, I specifically address the empowerment of women. You know, and it's something we're indoctrinated in in such an early age and in such an insidious way. Like, all of us, especially as young gay boys, have been told, don't be a sissy, don't cry like a girl, uh, man up. Like, this idea that somehow being a man is better than being a woman because if there was true equality and you saw a young boy expressing more feminine traits, you'd be like, mazel tov, congratulations. But it's this idea right. that without it being spoken, that somehow masculine qualities are better than feminine qualities. And we see this too in the queer community where how someone who is straight acting or someone who presents as a mask is sexually more desirable or has more per more prospective sexual partners than somebody who identifies as femme or gender queer. Yes. Um, and, you know, there's that old joke of just walk into a gay bar wearing dog tags and a ball cap and all guys will be all over you. Right? Like, it's, we've been so indoctrinated into that. Yes. Yes. And, and the assumption, the mistaken assumption in, in what you're saying that the feminine is weakness. That's why little boys don't cry because to cry is then you're like a little girl and that's weakness. It's like, wait a minute. Like so many faulty assumptions in that. One, that the feminine is weakness. It's like, wait, wait, you want to talk power, courage, resilience, ability to handle pain. Let's talk about the power of creation that resides in the female body. Um, and then the other assumption is that the emotions are weakness. It's like, wait a minute. You know, the, what, what used to be spiritual teaching that everything is energy, now we know from quantum physics that everything is energy. And in fact, that includes the body, that includes the emotions. Um, and so what happens because we have been so conditioned to believe that the emotions are weakness when they're not, they're just energy, like anything else in, in creation. Um, but, but because we suppress them, because we don't allow ourselves to, to express them, by the way, women also do, but men do it way disproportionately right. because of that conditioning. Um, what, what happens is that those emotions don't go away. They just don't disappear because we, we're not ready to deal with them. So every time and for all those times that we have stuffed our feelings yeah. and not said what we wanted, what we, we were feeling inside, that stuff doesn't go away, it gets stuck. It gets lodged in the tissues of the body. And after years and decades of doing that, we walk around with layers upon layers upon layers of repressed emotional crap. And then here we are trying to have a relationship in the present, all of it getting filtered through that lifetime of suppressed emotion and unhealed past trauma. Yikes. Like no wonder our relationships don't work. We haven't been taught how to hold them, how to approach them. And we certainly haven't been taught how to clear ourselves from all that, that lifetime of repressed emotions. So really important that, that we um, reframe our relationship to the emotions and to personal power. I love that. You know, and you, you bring to mind too, is I, I believe that one of our greatest both gifts, but also one of our greatest needs as humans, regardless of gender, is connection and having yes. intimate, meaningful connection. And one of the prerequisites to having true intimacy, platonic or sexual, doesn't matter, is the ability to be truly vulnerable, to see and be seen, to give somebody access to you and you to them. And when we block our emotions, as many men have been trained to do, as you said, that ability for vulnerability, that ability for connection becomes null and void. Like, how, how are you meant to do that when you can't even connect with yourself, when you don't even know what you're feeling, when you don't even know who you really are inside because you've been trained to perform masculinity. You've been trained to perform being a cowboy in a way of, I am emotionless and solid, 
and I'm sitting up on my horse, and no one's going to knock me off, and I'll shoot you if you try, and I'm a stone. <laughs> Yeah. That's not real. Yeah. None of, none no. of that is real. I mean, I, I happen to find cowboys really sexy. Well, sure. Um, I mean, I wouldn't say no to one. But I don't want to live but as let's, one. let's say robots instead of cowboys. Um, and, and yeah, what's really interesting about what you're saying is that recent research, I think from two, three years ago, um, is that at the core, at the root of addiction, is that longing for connection. Um, that that is that hole that we're trying to fill um, through uh, substances yes. or, or any other kind of addiction, be, addictive behavior. Um, and, and what we're talking about is that there's a price to pay for this. Like this hierarchical, you know, patriarchal system of power over, of um, the masculine being superior, of the feminine being inferior. Um, of course, women have paid a price for that. But so have men. And, and so no wonder, you know, when you look at, at statistics like the rate of suicide, um, in the U.S., men commit suicide four times as often as women do. And in fact, 70% of the suicides in the U.S. are committed by middle-aged white men. Really? Who still the group that maintains, you know, that holds the majority of the power in the world. And we would think, it's like, wait a minute, shouldn't, the most privileged group, the, the group that holds the majority of the power in current, uh, you know, e today, shouldn't they have more benefits? Shouldn't they have um, like measurable, uh, you know, benefits from doing that? But no, um, there's something off there, right. and 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 also the the longevity. Um, women outlive men by five years in the u.s by seven years globally so what's going on with all that and i think it's what we're talking about it's is that this misunderstanding this limited um and limiting perspective of what it means to be a man which part of it means that you got to walk around like this not feeling uncaring and there's a price to pay for that because of all those suppressed emotions we're talking about because all those emotions what happens we suppress we suppress we suppress and only two things can happen. Either, either what happens is either we, the next unfortunate one comes and rubs us the wrong way, says the wrong thing, and boom, volcanic eruption causing harm to, to our relationships. Or suppress, 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 suppress. That stuff has to come out. And what happens is it starts seeping up and out and showing up as bodily symptoms. Cancer, heart attacks, uh, ulcers. So again, we got we got to figure this out and, and and start redefining our relationship to our emotions. You know, you're bringing to mind to me a study done in primates around anxiety levels and stress levels. And they showed in primates, and this largely transfers to humans, that the higher up you are in the social hierarchy, the less stress you have, the less cortisol levels in your blood. Um, and that to be the lower levels is inherently more stressful because you're fighting for your survival. But the point you just brought up is even though straight white men are at the top of the proverbial food chain at the moment, there is this pressure, this dissatisfaction, this disconnection within that is causing a tremendous level of stress because it's not a genuine self-acceptance. It's not a genuine comfort with yourself. It's not a genuine integration with self. It's uh, masquerading as something um, if it goes far enough, even slipping in into toxic masculinity. Um, and by the way, I also That's want to right. just give a shout out to one of my favorite books because you brought up this idea of addiction. Um, one of my very favorite books is by a journalist named Johan Hari called Lost Connections. Uh, I have somebody, mm -hmm. something I've recommended to so many people and everyone's loved it. Right so if that's a topic that interests you about how uh, disconnection is a cause of uh, addiction and mental illness, I enthusiastically recommend it. Uh, yes. Question I have for you, and this is something that I love to play with, is what is masculinity? And also, what is femininity? Because I feel like it's a very difficult thing to truly describe because our cultural baggage around what masculinity and femininity is, is so learned. It's so programmed. The, yes. the swagger, the stoicness, you know, all of that. Women so seem to be, you know, demurring, to be frail, not take up physical space, be quite like, so much of that is programmed. My question for you is, 
what are the inherent qualities of masculinity and femininity in your mind? Yeah, I mean, that's a, such a profound question. And, and um, I, mean, I think ultimately we get to define that for mm -hmm. ourselves. Rather than having this binary, um, do it this way or that way. Um, and, I, and I think that's one of the ways in which the, the trans community serves us all, is like redefining um, our relationship to gender. Um, and, and so in this new book, Awakening the Soul of Power, um, as I said before, I, I address it directly to women because I believe that, um, and, and it's not to put women up on a pedestal, it's not to idealize women. Women also abuse power. Um, disproportionately, men do. Um, but it's because we have been running so off balance as a world, as a species, where it, where it, where it, in, in reference to this balance between the masculine and the feminine, um, energies and and we all do that not just who has nothing to do with just being in a, in a physical male or female body um, and so I believe that when women are in 50% of power in this world um, that we're gonna have a very diff different relationship to war and poverty and hunger and and how we treat the environment social justice education to all of it so so in targeting women specifically in this book, I'm doing that strategically. Like thinking what is one thing that we could do, as I see it, um, that will then impact all the other challenges that we're facing as a species. Um, and that's what I land on, the empowerment of women. Um, I also added a chapter on what it means to be a man in the 21st century, because of, of course we can't leave men behind. Um, and of course, you know, it's like I love men, obviously. Um, and so that's what I get. It, that's what I dive into in that book. So, for example, like think coming from the perspective that we have to redefine, we have to expand, we have to reboot uh, on this our perceptions of what it means to be a man in the 21st century, so that we break free from these old, um, unhealthy expressions and limiting expressions of what it means to be a man. So, for example, we look at one of one of the one of the roles that we uh, typically associate with with what a man does and that's the provider role and and which is by the way that is so connected to to so much of the strife that we're we're facing as in our culture is connected to that because men are are as as women step more and more into their powers like i think i forget the, the exact statistic but i think it was like two years ago more than 50 percent of, of college graduates mm -hmm. are now women so, and, and looking at heterosexual households, um, I think it's from 2017, I, ha I have the numbers in the book, uh, but m uh, we're approaching 40%. So maybe now it's, it's over 40% um, of, in heterosexual, looking at heterosexual households, in, in 40%, the woman is out earning the man. So that is one of the reasons why so many men, combined with you know outsourcing and, and how many jobs are being replaced by machines and robotics, no wonder a lot of heterosexual men are, are, are in crisis. Like, who am I if I'm not my paycheck, if I'm not the provider? Um, and and it's my, my heart goes out to them. I get it. I understand it. But what a limited way to, to define yourself as a man by the size of your paycheck. Um, it's so... So then if, if, if this is where we are and the way in which we seem to be going, um, what does it mean to be a provider? Are there other things that, that we could provide? And, 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 and of course the answer is yet, and that's what I get into in that chapter. Like I look at several different roles, but what, if, what, what, what about if we were provide for our families, for our kids, for our spouses, um, a, a safe space for them to grow, for them to expand, for them to be, what if we were to be that rock on which they could stand and then explore what they could be in this world and and with that having knowing that we have our our father role like behind us supporting us rooting for us it's like oh my god that is priceless that is so much more than than the size of the paycheck and and so that's just one of the one of my ideas about that totally you know i i wish i had that growing up i wish i had a father figure who demonstrated that but it wasn't it was you know, very much about being a provider. Uh, you yeah. brought, 
and, and likewise, my dad was a great provider. He was, he was. But but in in those more you know indefinable ways, um, I w- I too wish I would have had that. Yeah, I didn't. I did not learn how to be a man from my father. That's something I had to go out into the world and find a man. He's a great guy. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. he did not provide that for me. He brought to mind for me as yeah, you were talking too. to how you know you look at the animal kingdom because I always love to look at patterns elsewhere in nature. You think look yeah. at prides of lions. It's the women who go out and do the hunting, and the men, I guess, just hang out. I'm not, I'm not entirely sure what the male lions do, but like the women, or the, the female lions are the providers. Um, and this actually, yeah. for me, is an extrapolation too of this idea of um, an esoteric Indian philosophy, the balance of Shiva and Shakti, the balance of the divine masculine and the divine feminine. And when you take it up all the, to like the highest level, when it first differentiates from cosmic oneness and divides into masculine and feminine, I've often heard it described that the only two, the only qualities that are actually are present to differentiate is the masculine is still and experiencing itself, the feminine is creating and generating the known worlds and is active. And that's something that I kind of reflect on a little bit is like, women obviously have the ability to give life, they're able to create, to generate new things. Um, what if I strip away all of the defining things that I've been taught of what is masculine and what is feminine and just think, what if the energy of masculinity is to be in and of oneself and the energy of femininity mm-hmm. is to generate things externally, to create. Um, and I don't know if that's at all even part of or half the picture, but I, I think it's like an interesting to start to, to, to take apart the paradigms we've been given because some of the most secure and masculine men I've known have been deeply tender, deeply concerned about community, very loving, very connected with their emotions, very sensitive, like all these things that we have been taught to sever from our definition of masculinity, but those have been some of the most grounded and wonderful and complete men that I have met. And and to that end, I know there's a lot of judgments right now about like, oh, men's groups are like needing to like support them, but in a lot of ways, I think men as a whole have been so crippled into the roles they've been told to play that men have not had fathers who have demonstrated these things have not told us how to mature and to develop into the men that we need to be to heal the world that men need a lot of support they need a lot of work to learn how to be better and especially because they are currently the power holders and are going to have to learn to give some of that up you know the world will transition a lot better if we can teach men to relax into themselves, be willing to forfeit power, be willing to say, I can share. Just because I take up less of the pie doesn't mean I'm going to starve. In fact, I'll do better if you are doing better as well. And if, if we're able to do yeah. that, fingers crossed, hopefully we'll avoid civil war in America, because that might happen if white men can't give up their power, um, according to research. Um, but we'll be in a much healthier yeah, I have so many ways in which we could go from that statement. Um, and one of the things that comes up for me is, is like one of the ways in which I talk about how we step into power in a healthy way. Um, because we all have an ambivalent relationship to power. I would even say conflicted. Um, and I think that's part of the reasons for that. There's several reasons for that, but part, one of it is that we misunderstand power and that there are different kinds. So I talk about worldly power or ego power, which always has an agenda, is always trying to get something for itself, it's always self-aggrandizing, always blowing itself up to seek, to seem bigger than it actually is, and we don't have to go very far to look at recent political leaders to come up with examples of that. Um, And and yet, and and so arrogant, Um, and and it's really ultimately fear-based, like it comes from a place of believing that there's a limited amount. That power is a zero-sum game, so that your having power takes away from mine. It's like, but wait a minute. If I'm in my own power, why would I be threatened by you being in your power? It's like, I know who I am. I know I can handle whatever comes my way. That's real power. So to me, that's more like an expression of 
of what I call spiritual power, soulful power, for lack of other words, power that, that comes from within, that nobody can give to us, that nobody can take away from us. We are the only ones who give it away for, for kind of lame reasons that we give it away. You know, an illusion of security, a false sense of acceptance, more souls. We settle for more souls of pseudo love. Um, and, and it's the kind of power that, that is humble that it doesn't need to prove anything to anybody because it knows what it is. So I think of a Gandhi or a Gandalf, if you're into the Lord of the Rings, um, you know, with in their simple monastic robes, their sandal feet, you would never, ever know how much power they hold right. until it's needed. Then get out of the way. Uh, Gandhi, Gandhi brought the British Empire to its knees when it was at its highest point in terms of global reach without ever shooting a gun or landing a single punch. That's wow. power. Amen. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think that for me has been a lifetime goal of learning that true worth in oneself, but also learning one's size, accepting one's power and realizing that that is not ever something that can ever be given to you. It's something you have to be cultivating and discover within yourself because you mentioned recent political leaders. Like I, I feel immensely bad for Donald Trump because from my point of view, this is somebody who never believes he's good enough, who never believes that he is worthy or loved or enough, that there's this constant, relentless seeking of validation. Tell me I'm good enough. Tell me I'm good enough. And it's exhausting to watch and yes. it's heartbreating to watch, but it's it causes so much it strength it as opposed to just truly knowing your worth and finding that as an, an internal experience. And when you do that, as you said, you realize the more that people step into their power, the more that everyone else embraces them, the better the world becomes. I'm not, you know, it's not a competition. It's not a zero-sum game, as you said. So I love that. Uh, I was reading a, a, a yeah. piece of literature. Actually, it was in that book I just mentioned, um, The False Connections by Johann Hari, where he was commenting on this young woman having this really deep spiritual experience of oneness and connection and realizing that we're all the same. No one's better than another person. Like we are all God may manifest for all powerful. Yes. And then she went back to her job in London and started getting beaten down again, saying, No, 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 you're in this social position. I'm better than you because I have this job title. And you better learn that and you better know it. And that three months later she'd kind of forgotten yeah. that spiritual realization because the world kept saying, No, because I have this money, I have this car, I have this body, I have this job title, I have this award, I'm a better person than you and that's Pardon my language, but fucking bullshit. <laughs> I'm, I'm with you, and 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 that's those are all expressions of worldly power, right? We tend to associate power with things that are outside of us: how much money you have, how famous you are, how many followers you have, um, you know, whether how high how high are you up on some kind of hierarchy, whether it's the corporate ladder or a religious institution or whatever. But the thing about all those types and expressions of power, they're external. So yeah. they're fickle. Here today, mm -hmm. gone tomorrow. The company closes its, its doors like so many, so many hats went belly up during, because of the pandemic, and there it is. That was your identity. That was the source of your power, gone, poof. And, 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 and I'm with you about, I feel compassion for, um, for Donald Trump. Uh, because I think he, in some way that, that I don't think it's his intention, I'm pretty sure it's not his intention, but he exemplifies for us an ego run amok, out of control, and it's pretty quite tragic. You know, you could have all, but, but he exemplifies that you could have all the money you could want, you could have all the power you could want in this world, and you're still miserable and thin-skinned, and one tweet or something somebody says about you sends, sends you into a, a tailspin of, of self-hatred and trying to overcompensate for what, for poor self-esteem that is so evident to anybody who, I, who has the eyes to see that. So I actually feel quite deeply compassionate for him. Um, and, and so again, it, it's, it's, it highlights the other kind of power because worldly power um, comes from this, this belief that, that is hierarchical. So I had to push you down. I have to be higher up than you in order for me to feel powerful. I have to put a knee to your neck in order for me to feel powerful. Where it's like, wait a minute, what a twisted way to, to look at that. If, if Again, if I know who I am, if I'm in my power, then I don't need to prove it to anybody. I know. Um, it's like, you know, like 
Margaret, I think it was Margaret Thatcher's, it's, it's one of the quotes I have in the book, I think it was Margaret Thatcher who said, power's like a lady. If you have it, you don't need to show it. You don't need to prove it. You just know. <laughs> um, and so, and, and, and if we're going to be quoting, you know, women like that, going back to this, this conversation about the, the, whether the female is powerful or not, whether the feminine is powerful or not, um, this is Betty White, whom, you know, what a tragic loss to humanity a few months ago. But I read somewhere, I don't know if it's, if it's true, but I read that it was one of these um, celebrity interviews where there's like, you know, three or four celebrities being, being interviewed and one of them supposed to said, said something about uh, having balls. And she goes, wait a minute, where do we get this as a connection, this association between courage and strength with balls? Because you thump those little things and the guy bends over, collapses in pain. You want to talk power? You want to talk strength? Let's talk vaginas. Those things take a pounding. <laughs> that is amazing. I am bookmarking that. <laughs> and again, I don't know if it's real or if it's just myth urban myth but it, it sounds like her. What, a, what a beautiful <laughs> illustration of male fragility despite all the huffing and puffing i love that yeah I love that. I, and and yeah you were talking earlier about you know the, the the what is masculine and what is feminine and that's one of the other roles that i highlight you know that we have traditionally associated um masculine roles as destroyers uh you know guys like to blow shit up um and so, but, you know, so I think, you know, I use the example of, of Shiva, you know, the destroyer, but it's, it's blowing stuff up with intention so that something new can come up in its place. It's not just blowing it up for the hell of it. Um, it's, it's that cycle of death and rebirth. Um, and by the way, if we're, if we're thinking, if we're talking about destruction, let's talk Kali, you know, it's like the, I can't think of a most powerful, um, Goddess, you know, it's the one that the the goddess, the, the one that's portrayed with her tongue hanging out. The reason for that is that because the the male gods, the male deities, were engaged in this, they were losing a battle against the demons because every time they they slayed uh, or slew, I don't know what the right expression. The expression Let's go with I guess slow, they slew because why not? They slew or slayed. <laughs> And every time one of them got slain, um, and a, a, a drop of blood would, blood would hit the ground, another one would burst forth. And so that's why they summoned Kali, who would scoop with her tongue the blood, and then they ended up, before it hit the ground, and then they ended up winning the battle. Um, so yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I, there was a time in my practice where I did a dedication to do a puja, or a set of offerings to Kali every night like three months and after about a month of it i had to tap out and be like you know can we just switch to durga because this is really intense this is this is a very altered <laughs> uh, uh, my perception of the world is continuously being thrown into a sense of chaos can, can we downgrade a little bit this is she's very strong <laughs> yeah. that's funny I, I went to this um one of my favorite stores in san francisco um, for the for the love of ganesh in the hate ashbury um, and I was looking for a Kali because I'd been kind of afraid of her. Um, and, and so I told um, a picture the, of the owner, she goes, oh, no, 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 honey, you, well, there she is. She goes, oh, no, 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 honey, you don't want her in your house because she's going to, she's going to, you know, bring up stuff and she's going to, she's the destroyer. So then it took me like another three years until somebody else told me, yes, but she's also the mother. Yeah. What she's destroying is the ego stuff, the stuff that isn't congruent, that isn't a match with who we are. It's all that, that ego stuff. And so I said, oh, okay, yeah. okay. Then I brought her in into my house, I, into my temple. I was in India one time working, and this person, I was commenting about Kali. They're like, oh, you don't over invoke Kali. Don't, don't, don't invite Kali. Don't do her mantra. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I love it. It's, it's one of the things that I also really so appreciated early on in my exploration of yoga, tantric, Eastern spirituality, was the greater rever reverence for the Divine Feminine and the power of the Divine Feminine. And, um, you know, uh, for me personally, they, they talk, they say to me, Ishtadeva, it's it's like your, your strongest connection to an aspect of God. For many years, I very much felt that mine was with Goddess Durga. Um, but just really 
still appreciating an alternative view that embraced the feminine is just as powerful, just as strong, just as critical, and that they are the other half of creation, they are the other half of yes. the universe. And a world that subjugates half of itself cannot be in balance. It just doesn't make any sense. Like, like creation is masculine and feminine equally balanced. We are, as far as we know, as far as I know. That's how life happens. We only speak. Masculine and feminine perfectly balanced. Seriously. Yeah. Like instead of a creator, we should really be talking about a creatrix. That's, that's, and, and we all know that, that before we had a god, we had a goddess. Um, and, and I'm not advocating, neither one of us is, that we go back to a matriarchal system. I think what we need is balance. We need to find that balance, not only in, if, in the world, but inside each one of us. And, and that's, by the way, that's one of the 10 archetypes that I highlighted in, in um, coming out spiritually, the divine androgyne. Um, because in, in many traditions, like in many Native American traditions, the, the people and, and Eastern traditions, uh, people who cross those rigid definitions of boundary and, and who embody both the masculine and the feminine um, were considered sacred yeah. and honored and revered. Um, and, and even, and there are many examples of that that I bring up in the book, but even, even if we're going to go with like traditional, um, if you're gonna, like looking at Christianity, for example, um, which I, I guess the Catholicism, they didn't completely get rid of the feminine. I still, they, they still honor the feminine in some way in the person of Mary. Um, she's off to the side. It, yeah, it, it's not a 50-50 yeah. thing. Um, and then with the Mary Magdalene, um, you know, she had to be turned into a prostitute yeah. um, to take her power away. So you have to be either a virgin or you're turned into a prostitute. Um, but um, in, the, in the Gnostic Gospels, in the Gospel of Thomas, Jesus is said to have said that not until you marry within yourself the masculine and the feminine will you find the kingdom of God. Yes. And the kingdom of God, of course, not being this mythical place that that that, that we have placed away from ourselves. Like how much, how much further could we have placed heaven away from ourselves? And where the hell is heaven anyway? Uh, but but the, the state of being that he was really talking about, that's right here. Like he also said the kingdom of God is within. Um, and these and greater things you'll do. Uh, so, um, to me, that that divine androgyne is it is a sacred role. Um, it's something I have also said for years too, and why I'm so delighted to read it in your book is that idea that if we view wholeness as bringing both ends of polarity together, the queer experience is that of holding both the masculine and feminine within. Like, what is more sacred? That you know, a straight person theoretically has to join with their opposite to create that balance, whereas we hold that balance within and of ourselves because we embody both. Yes, yes. And, and, and another one of the roles in, is the mediator role because of what you're saying, because of the fact that in, in the Native American traditions that, you know, so we're often called two spirits, like out of the 500 or so tribes, the great majority of them honored uh, the two spirit. Two spirit is more like an umbrella term. They each have their, um, their, their particular name for for the roles that we play, but because we were thought to contain both the masculine and the feminine essence, that made us great mediators. So when there was strife in the village um, or in the tribe between the men and the women, we were the ones that kind of mediated and solved the problems. We also mediated between the f this physical reality and the other realms yeah. like so like when somebody passed when somebody died we knew the songs we knew the rituals um to facilitate the, the their passing uh, um, and i think it was andrew raymer who came up with this term um will roscoe maybe uh midwives for the dying uh, that you know we we, we often facilitated that role and i'm particularly touched by the role that the lesbian community played in facilitating that role in, in, in during the AIDS crisis, yes. like, and and I, if, you know, helping so many guys transition, and I and they don't get acknowledged for that enough. So I always try to, to bring that in, bring awareness to them. They were definitely our heroes, absolutely, um, and also too with the experience of being queer, or gender non-conforming, or sexually not conforming too. We know it from a very young age, and we know we're different, we know we're an outsider, even if we can't name it yet. 
And so what is the experience of seeing the divine, but seeing the other, seeing that which is beyond the veil of normality? And by being queer, we are, from our very earliest ages, starting to explore that idea of otherness, like that idea of being different from the mundane, from being different from the ordinary world. Um, I'm a, personally a big believer that part of the reason that there is so much mental health issues in the LGBT community, and we talked about suicide earlier, suicide rates um, in among LGBTQ teens, I think it's still like one in three will attempt suicide or seriously consider it. Um, I, I personally believe that part of the reason there is such mental anguish is disconnection from purpose. Yes. That we are meant to be fulfilling these roles and because we're not that's why our community is suffering and as you said at the very beginning of this conversation is there any surprise why when you look at the dominant religions especially in the west that say in best case scenarios usually love the sinner hate the sin which is not true acceptance it's not the true celebration of who you are it's still heavily judgmental and in worst cases it gets much darker and meaner than that Mm-hmm. Um, that we've rejected our spiritual calling, but I, I, I do truly feel that we are meant to be the harbingers of change. We are meant to be the acolytes. We are meant to be yeah. the divine intercessors. Um, and it's, you know, it, I got frustrated when I first started this channel. I had somebody else who wanted to collaborate reach out to me and they said, well, you're going to have a really hard time if your demographic is queer men because they're not very spiritual. Like you need to start marketing yourself to women more because you'll get a lot of women followers. And I'm like, yeah, but I feel like that's where my work is. My work is, is speaking to the people who I share a similar body and a similar, similar life experience to. And we as queer folk and gay men in particular need to realize that life isn't all about having the greatest clothes or the hottest body or the sexiest boyfriend or going to the right parties. That our differences are sacred gifts that we need to embrace and that there needs to be a greater awareness that to be gay is a tremendous gift and it gives you abilities that other people do not have as a mediator as an artist as a as a spiritual being and that if you reconnect with them and you reconnect with your divine purpose your purpose you've incarnated with we will be so much healthier as a human Yes, yes, yes. Amen, brother. Preach. Um, yeah, and you just like brought up several more of the archetypes, you know, the outsider. Yeah, so many of us woke up, I mean, grew up feeling like there was something wrong with us, like we were different. But there's a gift in that, right? The, the, that, that ability to, the fact that we're outsiders gives us that ability to, to see the forest and the trees. That's, that's what makes so many of us great you know, artists and observers and chroniclers of society. Yes. We're also the, the, um, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the consciousness scouts, right? So because we're outsider, we're kind of ahead of the, ahead of the curve. Um, so you know, the, the, the role of a, of a scout in a tribe is he or she who goes ahead of the tribe to, to see what's on the other side of the river, around the mountain, through the forest, and then comes back and reports. So it's a great role, that, it's a great service that we play um, because we place ourselves at risk. We, we abandon the safety of, of being in the group and place ourselves at risk, and, and we're, we're explorers too, like explorers of consciousness. Um, and, and so, you know, it's roles that we've always played. Like we're always, you know, the ones who, who go in there and we're setting trends in fashion, music, and the arts. We're going into those neighborhoods that are, are about to experience a renaissance and um, discover them. And it's the way that it works is that you know, the girls go in and make it safe and, th- and then the boys go in and make it pretty. Just kidding. Just kidding with those typical roles. But um, it's funny because I, I write about this in, in Coming Out Spiritually. There's a, somebody was telling a story about um, a, a gay parade, a pride parade in, in, I think it was San Diego. And, you know, the typical suspects were walking by, the, the, the political groups and the religious groups, etc. Uh, and then somebody noticed that off on the side, and on the sidewalk was a straight couple, and they had this huge sign, move to blah, 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 whatever the neighborhood was, because they knew that if we, if we went in there, the property values would go up. <laughs> Um, priests, you know, sacred sacred priest roles, all over so much evidence of that. 
um, all over the planet. And, and then I, I totally agree with you and what you said that about the cause of so much suffering and, and the rate of addiction in our societies and suicide. It's because of that disconnection with our essence, disconnection with true purpose. And, and I had that role, the gatekeeper role I got from um, Maladoma Somme, uh, who passed recently, I think just a few months ago. Um, and he's from the Dagora tribe in Africa. As a kid, um, you know, he was, I don't know if, if kidnapped is the right word, but he was taken from his uh, tribe and grew up in a, in, a, in a religious community. And so as, as an adolescent, he ran away and he made his way back to his village and reconnected with the indigenous ways. And the Dagra, uh, which I think is in Eastern Africa, uh, they believe that the world is like a matrix of energy that has certain doorways or windows or gateways into other re realms, other rea realities. And in their philosophy, people that we would call LGBTQ or whatever, because they don't even have a term for that, um, we are the ones that are like constitutionally, energetically capable of being the guardians to these, to these gates. To, to these other realms and realities. And I was very touched because I interviewed a few people who have done work with him. I've met him, but I've never done his week and I've heard him speak. Um, but in this weekend, um, the visual is beautiful because at the end of the weekend, it all kind of pointed to this thing where to this final ceremony that was outdoors and they created with ash this whole, this huge X-shaped uh, uh, Form on this. so in the bottom of you know the fat part of the egg there was a fire, and and a bonfire and there was drumming, and you know like they for hours they were building up the energy, and then on the top part of the egg there was they had a drone a line and ash too, and as people were kind of finally moved by the spirit or by the energy or whatever they would get right up to the line and then connect with their ancestors and some people were like in such an altered state that they would, would they would want to throw their bodies over the line which in their belief would be dangerous not only spiritually but even physically so in the beginning of the weekend they had identified two gay men and two and two lesbians who were the guardians to to, to the, who were literally guarding people up between the, the realms and when he asked for volunteers like a lot of hands went up and he said no you don't understand you, you have to be gay or lesbian to do that um, but that's their job um, and there's sometimes they would have to like physically tackle people so they wouldn't throw their bodies over that line um, and so I was very touched by that story, and because he also says that part of the reason of the world is that the shape that it's in, and, and with all these problems that we're facing, is because the gatekeepers have been fired from their jobs. And, and so that's why I value so much your work and, and my work, too, to help us reclaim that and to find ways of expressing that spiritual connection, that innate spiritual connection, because it's innate. It's who we are. It's just as ludicrous to try to reject or run away from our spirituality as it is to do the same from our sexuality, which I know I tried to do um, both of those at some point in my life. So it's, it's just part, they're just part of who we are, inherent parts of being human. And let's even look at like the archetype of like what most people think of when they think of a gay man. They probably think about somebody out at a disco on a dance floor in an altered state of consciousness because of chemical vibing, probably engaging in sexual experiences or an orgy, which are all also archetypical religious experiences. Yes. Right? Like just to think about how our social partying has been a kind of, for lack of a better word, bastardization of religious rights to enter altered states, alternative realities. Yes. Um, yes. And, you know, like an alternative, something that came to mind to me too is like, let's take an alternative view of monkhood. Let's put a group of same sex, spiritually attuned people and have them live together. Well, that seems awfully gay, doesn't it? That seems awfully queer. And like, you think about it, you'd be like, well, if we put the men and women together, they're gonna have babies. Going, their focus is going to go elsewhere. It's going to turn away from the pursuit of their spiritual life because kids take a lot of focus. In life. But if we have men together and women together where that's no longer an option and they're sharing love, they're sharing experience, like, that's, a, that's a very queer gay situation that I'm very much into. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're so right, by the way. I, I'm totally with you about these ceremonial 
um, experiences, even using uh, substances in a sacred, intentional way, not to run away, right? The, the substance itself is neutral. It can be used as a drug to run away and to numb out and to not feel and to escape from ourselves yes. or to think that we can escape from ourselves because you can't. Really, that stuff that we're trying to run away from, you really can't. It doesn't go away. Yeah. It only festers and gets worse. Like those emotions or you suppress. <laughs> right, right. Or you can use it for expansion and connection and, and for breaking through limited perceptions of, of, what it, of reality. Um, and, and so there's so much literature, as you know, in the shamanic traditions where substances or sexuality were used to, alt, to, to attain those more expansive al altered states of consciousness. Um, so, and I think, you, I think you're right. I think it's just that, that in those settings, um, I mean, I know I've had mind-altering experiences just in, in, a, in, a, in a dance experience because you kind of pop out of yourself and the kind of limited perspective of, of who you are. It's so it, the problem is that they're just not being done intentionally. Yeah. Um, and then people are having experiences that they don't know what to do with. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, it's not something I thought of before, but it fits perfectly that idea of these archetypes of gay modern life are just reappropriations of the spiritual rites of passage that we should be conducting for other people and be using intentionally. Um, yeah. And I, I feel the same way too. Like, I used to be very, very judgmental about plant medicine, about hallucinogens, psychedelics. Um, until last year, I went to Ecuador and went on an ayahuasca retreat, and a San Pedro retreat. And it was absolutely phenomenal for me. And I now will, once or twice a month, use psilocybin mushrooms, since that's much more easily accessible, as an intentional gateway to a deeper connection with spirit and myself. But sitting in my meditation room, doing mantra, working with psilocybin is very different from, well, let me just go be crazy and go out and blah, and dance like it's, again, it's a tool, but how are you using it? You can yes. use the metaphor of a gun, right? You can use a gun to go get dinner, or you can use the gun to shoot somebody. Same tool, yeah. different purpose. Yeah, yeah, it's in, in, in that type of sacred medicine experience, it's all about set and setting, who you do it with, where you do it, and with what intention. Um, you know, my adolescence was one long depression uh, with suicidal fantasies. Um, and because I was raised in a very, very Catholic environment, and I was told, you know, while there was a part of me that had this longing, which, which I have always managed to give expression to, but had a longing to to serve the sacred, to serve God as I understood it then, to, to serve humanity, to make a difference in this world. Um, but I was, you know, had th that going on, and I was being told with the religion in which I was raised that I was going to burn in hell for eternity, that I was an abomination in the eyes of God. Um, and so no wonder you know, I had conflicts growing up. Um, but I'm grateful for them because I was forced to ask those, those profound existential questions that we all need to face at some point. Who am I and what am I doing here, uh, basically? Um, and I had to face those questions at an early age, like many of us do. Uh, so we kind of got a head start when, we, when you have to, like, I wouldn't want to go through that again, but I'm grateful because it gave me such a deep sense of who I am and it, and it also gave me compassion. Like, I like, I'm able to understand and feel with, um, to feel somebody else's pain. The details might be different, but I know what it like. I know self-hatred. I, I know what that feels like. Um, and I know how to break free from it. So I can guide somebody out of that. Um, and so, and self-doubt, the same thing. Uh, but there were three things that, that popped me out of that. Uh, one was... I took a class in existentialism, a philosophy class in, in college, and that began the process of, of questioning uh, the Catholic worldview, which is all that I knew. Um, at that point, I went to Catholic high school, um, all the way Catholic Jesuit high school. Um, the then I had a, <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're great educators. Um, I almost became a Jesuit. Um, and it connects to these three things because I actually had a conversation with, with the head of the novitiate, the guy who decided who got in to the Jesuits Jez and who didn't. And thankfully, he was a wise man who said, well, why don't you do a few years of college and, th and then we'll talk. In those three years, uh, several things happened. 
um, you know, I, I had that, ex I started like the deeper questioning through, through that um, uh, existentialism class. I had a phase of experimentation with mind expanding substances, which deepened and accelerated that, that, that questioning reality and everything that I knew. Um, and then I fell in love. And I'd had a lot of sex as a teenager. I had a lot of sex, but it was always hidden in the down low and guilt ridden. And this time I fell in love. And not to create a hierarchy of sex, but for me, when I experienced sex and love together, it was like, wow, that's what I want. And, and, and not, not that sex has to be this amazing experience of love making every time. Uh, I'm not saying that, but for me, it's like it healed. Um, it healed that. Like, I remember the first kiss with my first lover. It's like from that moment on, there wasn't a priest or a minister or a rabbi or a psychiatrist or anybody who could tell me that it was wrong. It's like I knew in the core of my being in my cells mm -hmm. that it was so beautiful that how could it be wrong? How could it be? How could it be a sin? How could it be a sickness? It just wasn't. Changed everything. You're sparking for me too how something my husband and I have talked about is. Uh, we, we've been monogamous for the first six years of our relationship and then the past year explored opening up and what would that be like. Uh, kept coming back to like, well, I would just prefer to just be with you. But one of the things we kind of came to was just saying, well, really, the reason why we find so many sexual situations outside of ourselves disappointing is we're really interested in having sex that is healing. The people approach sex from the modality of this isn't just about pleasure. This is a healing experience for everyone. And if somebody's open to that, then great. Yes, come play with us. Sounds great. But this idea of just fucking the fuck. Like, again, not, not to yuck someone's yum, not to, you said it, leave beautifully, make a hierarchy out of sex, but like, what is, what is the greater purpose? And for me, friction isn't enough. It just isn't. Yeah. I could do that better by myself. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and I know you and I are not the only ones, you know, who walked away from a sexual encounter, like asking ourselves, why did I bother? Yeah. Like, I could have handled that at home uh, with my five best friends. Exactly. Um, <laughs> right? It's like sometimes we walk away from sexual encounters feeling emptier than when we did, when, when, when I think what we're really longing, going back to connection, I think what we're really longing for is that deeper connection. And that's why we walk away feeling empty because it's just missing. Um, at least for me, at least for me it is. And, and again, not a hierarchy, no judgment on that. I've had, you know, sex for sport many times um, with, without that love connection. But, but these days that is just, it's, for me, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. I believe that's a very common experience. I mean, from so many men I've talked to, even men who have had sex with thousands of partners, have confided to me and said the number of times where I've actually genuinely really enjoyed it, I can probably count on two hands. And it's like, it's, it's sad. And going back to that idea of connection too, we need a connection with life. Genuine, meaningful connection. And you can have a conversation, through eye contact, through conscious touch, but a very easy way to force connection is through sex. But what yes. the issue is, is if you don't know that's what you're looking for, if you don't know that the whole inside of you is a lack of connection, a lack of meaningful, heartfelt, spiritual, soulful connection, brotherhood, love, however you want to name it and you try to fill that hole with sex, which is a connected hand. So to speak. It's, it's going to fall short. <laughs> it's going to be shallow. Yeah. yeah. And, and by the way, you, we can do this unilaterally. Like we can bring that intention unilaterally. Um, like I don't, I'm not on the dating apps or the, or the hookup apps because because of my public role, I'm very protective of my public role and I'm a very, very private person and understandably who wants to connect or with somebody who won't put their face on there. Um, but a few years ago, um, well, not so many, maybe 10 years ago, um, I did and I did was able to connect with somebody without using my face pick. Um, 
and so there I was, you know, going to to their to to their place to 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 meet them, and I bring the intention, like like even even in that what was an, an anonymous um, encounter, we ended up being great friends, and we're like still like deeply connected, and ended, ended up having a love affair, and mm. um, are still deeply connected. Um, but anyway, on, a, on the way to his place. I, I brought in, you know, it's like I intentionally invoked the sacred. And it doesn't have to be like a personification of the sacred. It could be love, like, right? The, the most powerful force in creation. It could be that. So whatever, whatever is sacred to us, we could invoke it. And I invoke it into the experience. And without saying a word, you know, I, I get to his place and he's watching football and drinking a couple of beers and no judgment on that. But I did have the thought, uh oh, <laughs> I think I might, might have made a mistake here until I went to the bathroom upstairs and then, you know, he had his candles lit up and there was a little Buddha statue. I said, okay, all right, I'm glad I followed my gut. Um, long story short, we had an amazing, amazing time. It was beautiful and heart connected and we didn't speak about any of this. Um, it's, it's just what was there present on the, on the way out. Uh, as I'm, you know, walking out the door, he starts going like this. Um, obviously, he'd gone to yoga class, so he was doing, he was doing the, the, you know, the namaste thing, catches himself and kind of tries to cover it up doing something like this. But it was too late because, you know, five years in an ashram, my body is also very trained. So I had already gone back, to, done it in return. Um, and, and I mean, just the point is that, that if we bring the intention, it, it can shift everything. Um, as we begin, you know, on this journey of, of bridging this chasm uh, that we have, most of us have, between the physical and the spiritual. I think everyone can see why I was so excited to have this conversation with Christian here on this channel. Um, Christian, you are a delight. You are a light in the world. You are an amazing human being. I feel so much kinship and brotherhood with you. And I'm so grateful to be walking this planet with you and to get to hear your beautiful thoughts and ideas and connect in this way. And if you're up for it and willing, I'd love to have another conversation on here with you. Um, but this has been such a wonderful I would love it, Kate. Anytime. Anytime, anything, and, and right back at you. You know, it's like projection of the psychological uh, defense mechanism also works that way that we, we also see in the other what's also in here. So right back at you. Um, and uh, yeah, let's continue the conversation. I would, I would love to, and um, would look forward to connecting in, in third dimensional reality at, at some point, and to meeting your husband at, at some point when the time allows. Absolutely, Christian Deloy. Hello, everyone. Please check out his website. Um, he, you know, when we're recording this, he's about to do a five-day free um, online program. Um, it will already have passed by the time you guys see it, but I know he's always doing this stuff. Um, so please check him out, get on his mailing list, and uh, support him anyway you can. Thank you for being here. Thank you. And you mentioned, thank you so much, Kay. And then you mentioned Ecuador, which is where I'm um, living right now. And I'm putting together a 10 day spiritual trek. I call them soulful treks. So, component, what would happen if a retreat and a, and a vacation got married and had yes. a child? So, they'll be, we'll have some amazing experiences. Um, and see this amazingly beautiful country, and then we'll do some uh, some retreat experiences too, like breath work and uh, de mezcal, which is a, a sweat lodge in the South America tradition. We're, we're in Ecuador. Uh, so yeah, it's we're gonna we're gonna be in Quito some of the time. Uh, we're going to Papayacta, to which is amazing, ex exquisitely beautiful hot springs, one of the most beautiful places I've been to, um, and. Mindo, which is the, the cloud forest. We're going to spend a night there and have a chocolate tour and um, do some other fun stuff like that. And then we're going to drive to Chimborazo, which is the tallest volcano here. Um, it's actually no, not as tall as the Mount Everest, which I think is like 30,000 30, feet elevation. Chimborazo is only 20,000, but because it's so close to the equator, it's the place on the planet where you can actually be closest to the sun. Um, and so it's kind of cool. It's a beautiful, beautiful drive and down there. And when is this retreat? Yeah. It's going to be in October. I think it's the 6th through the 16th. If, if they go to my website, to soulfulpower.com, um, get on my email list. They'll, they'll get information about that. And just by 
get, getting on my email list um, will send them. And we know how click how easy it is to click unsubscribe if it doesn't work for them down the road. But for anybody watching this, get on my email list and we'll send them a sample, sample chapter of the book of um, Awakening the Soul of Power that talks about what it means to... Um, what it means to live a heroic life in the 21st century. Um, and the book is all about how we step into power in a way that's authentically a match for who we are. Um, we'll send them some power practices that are designed to integrate and apply those teachings into our lives so that they don't stay at the level of information. Okay, as you know, we don't need any more information. We've got information overload um, at our fingertips. Um, whereas, you know, in the old years, you had, you'd have to go off to the ashram or monastery to get this wisdom that now they're just online, <laughs> accessible to anybody. Uh, so, so what we need is transformation. And that comes from really living those teachings. Um, as you know, um, having had a, also a, a profound ashram experience for seven years. Um, and we'll send them also a guided meditation that I created last year in the middle of the pandemic two years ago, um, about how we can get to a place of trust. How do we live in trust in these times of chaos and uncertainty and mm. fear? Thank you for all your beautiful work that you share with the world. Thank you. Thank you.